you just mentioned that when you started sort of writing about film philosophically that there weren't a lot of series like the philosophy of books that yeah. wanted this kind of writing. And you yourself started in very traditional philosophical fields, yeah. so philosophy of language, philosophy yeah, of mind. Exactly. How did you become interested in aesthetics and what finally pushed you to take that up as your main research interest? Well, I had loved movies you know, since I was a kid in Oregon. I mean, I just got into a lot of movies. And, you know, sometime in the 60s, it became then a very fashionable topic. That was the period with the rise of the auteur theory, where, if you know what that mm -hmm. is, is I did emphasis on the directors and whatnot coming out of France. And I was a little skeptical, but I was very interested in that, and I read that stuff, and I went to a lot more movies. And, and my first job was at the University of Pittsburgh, and I knew this this dean there and who knew uh, that I knew a fair amount about movies and he wanted the University of Pittsburgh to have a movie course, an introduction to film. And he wanted me to do it. And I thought, oh, no, 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 you know. You know, I was trained in doing philosophy and mathematics. I'm just not qualified to do this. Now, so I finally broke down and agreed to do it. And I could just wreck my whole career because I felt so unqualified to do this class. But I spent a lot of about the first three years of my career, you know, going to movies and reading more and more and so on. But at any rate, so I taught this film course, and then I did come to realize that some of the lectures that I was giving on some of the films were quite different than anybody else was, you know, what people were saying about those films. So then I started publishing and uh, mostly interpretive work, and it just kind of grew and. Uh, yeah, wrecked my movie going <laughs> experience. Don't professionalize what you love. Right? <laughs> it is a lesson. Right? Well, um, along your career, would you say that there's been any particular individuals that have influenced or continue to influence your work? Well, yeah, I mean, lots of people. It's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples because, you know, I don't want to sound for a minute like. You know, I just all did it all myself. And <laughs> one guy, oddly enough, is that uh, this may come as some surprise. I have a brother, a brother four years younger, who's also a philosopher. In fact, teaches at University of Pittsburgh now. But, uh, and he is the one, when he was an undergraduate going to read college, who really got uh, kind of seriously interested in film, auteur theory and all this stuff. So he was one guy that got me started, and he still knows a lot about this stuff, but he's never actually pursued it professionally. But he had a big impact on me. That I thought, wow, well, what mark is that, you know? So this, then when I was reading uh, professional stuff, and okay, this is a nice story. I would, not a funny story, but a touching right. story really like it. One of the people that I most admired was a British critic by the name of Victor Perkins. There were sort of two guys early uh, in the 60s that just did fantastic work on film, Robin Wood and, and Victor Perkins. And so, you know, I just learned so much reading them from these guys, but I hadn't met either one of them. So then my book on film came out and hardly roared to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, <laughs> I didn't think it sold very many copies at all. But okay, so it was out. But then I get this letter from England, and it was this Victor Perkins who had read it. And it wasn't just that he liked it. It had kind of inspired, he had kind of gotten discouraged about the state of film studies and hadn't written anything much for five or six years. And my book sort of started him writing again. Uh, and that just doesn't happen too much. I mean, this guy mm -hmm. that you know had such a big impact on me to find out years later that I could do something that would impact him. That was really very nice. And he's a friend to this day. But uh, well, to follow up on that, so Robin Wood actually recently passed away. Right. Do you have any stories like that with Robin Wood? No, I actually him? never met Robin Wood. I I, I regretted it. Uh, Victor Perkins stayed at Warwick in England, and I came to know a lot of those people, but Wood went to uh, Toronto 
And there were, yeah, there were various times I was supposed to meet him, but it didn't work out. Well, uh, you've you've argued in uh, in print that the interpretation of individual films is often more illuminating of the aesthetic possibility of film than the the sort of abstract theorizing that that philosophy is known for. What what are some films that that do this, and how have they contributed to our understanding of film? Well, let me, if this is okay, this is an example that I gave yesterday uh, in the session that we had yesterday, but it's, it's just a, it's a f fairly simple, though important example. Uh, one of the films that I got interested in pretty early in my career in these early courses was a famous uh, movie by Fritz Long made in 1936, I think it was, German director who had come to the United States. The name of the movie was You Only Live Once. And it was you know, already a pretty well-known movie, although it was thought of as being a sort of Depression-era social conscious type movie. This poor proletariat hero played by Henry Fonda uh, is pursued by the prejudices of society and eventually at the end of the movie he and his girlfriend are killed. And you know, I, you know, I got to think. You know, this movie is so weird. I mean, it, uh, it sets up all these doubts. For at any rate, to cut it, cut it short, what I, the conclusion that I came to, and I argue this at length in the relevant essay, is that this movie, the narration of the movie, the telling of the story uh, in an audiovisual terms is systematically unreliable in a way that I never would have imagined before. That is to say, you're sort of, uh, the question is raised, well, is this guy really guilty of bank holdup and various other things? Uh, but then certain predominant structures in the movie lead you to think, well, now nah, he's a poor, innocent. it's Henry Fonda after all, <laughs> and the innocent guy. But there's just, too much stuff, you know, sort of in the background, not foregrounded in, in the movie that undercuts that. I mean, I think, you know, the truth is you just don't know whether he committed this crime or not. So here was this movie that, I, you know, that had the possibility of sort of radically unreliable narration that just n never had occurred to me. Now, you know, now we're used to, <coughs> though they work in different ways, Usual Suspects, Fight Club, I mean, films that do have unreliable narration, but not in this sense. And the possibility of film being involving an unreliable telling, mm -hmm. that, was, uh, that was one big instance. So your principal work in aesthetics is on sort of this question of film narration and... Yeah, I mean, I th in some ways I think it's you know, kind of pathetically <laughs> obsessive <laughs> in the sense that, yeah, I mean, my book uh, really is broadly on question, you know, what would a theory of point of view be for the, the cinema, partly because of examples like You Only Live Once with the unreliable narration. So, you know, you're talking about various kinds of narrational strategies in film. But then, as the years went on, I have been forced, and Rukenia would be one example, to think in sort of more basic ways, of, you know, what is film narration in the first place? Mm -hmm. How do you even conceive of our, you know, perceptual or imaginative relationship to it? And I found these questions surprisingly difficult. I mean, I, you know, I, I think if they're pursued rigorously, they're as hard as most other questions in philosophy. So I've sort of stuck with it. I mean, there's a way in which maybe I'll loosen up and find another another topic. But you're, you're quite right. I mean, that has, I've got a book uh, coming out from Oxford that will be basically on questions about the nature of film narration. 